You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon, and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Back in the 1540s, Jacques Cartier, a French explorer, was the first to write down his experiences with the Native Americans, despite the fact that French traders and fishermen had already been mingling with locals near the St. Lawrence River estuary for fur trade a decade earlier. Cartier described meeting the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, who lived in fortified communities such as Stadacona and Hochelaga, and mentioned their conflict with a group called the Tudaman. Later on, due to wars and politics distracting France, it wasn't until the 17th century that they started to establish colonies in the St. Lawrence Valley, founding Quebec in 1608. When the French came back to the area, they discovered that places like Stadacona and Hochelaga were deserted and in ruins, and the people who once lived there were gone. Why these sites were abandoned is still a mystery, but some believe the Mohawk nation might have had a hand in driving the St. Lawrence Iroquoians away or destroying their settlements. Before the year 1603, Samuel de Champlain formed an alliance to oppose the Iroquois, deciding not to supply them with firearms because they were disrupting the lucrative fur trade with other indigenous groups. In 1609, Champlain took a stand in a battle against the Mohawks at Lake Champlain, stating, I had come with no other intention than to make war. During this encounter, he managed to kill two Mohawk chiefs with his gun, despite their protective armor, causing the Mohawk to retreat. In the following years, Champlain continued to support local allies like the Algonquins and the Hurons in battles against the Iroquois. In 1610, they defeated a major Iroquois raiding party, and in 1615, Champlain joined a Huron group in an attack on an Iroquois town, likely located south of Lake Ontario. Unfortunately, this assault did not succeed, and Champlain ended up injured. Between 1610 and 1614, the Dutch set up various seasonal trading stations along the Hudson and Delaware rivers. One notable post was established on Castle Island by the east edge of Mohawk Territory near what's now Albany. This move brought the Iroquois through the Mohawk directly into European trade markets. With their efforts and eventual establishments in areas like New Jersey and Delaware, the Dutch began trading with the local Delaware tribe, also known as Lenape, and the more southern Susquehannock tribe. In 1614, the Dutch established Fort Nassau, followed by Fort Orange, in 1624, both located in present-day Albany. These forts eliminated the Iroquois' dependence on French traders and the need to navigate through territories of southern tribes for trading. The Dutch equipped the Mohawks and other Iroquois nations with firearms. Furthermore, the trading posts provided essential tools in exchange for animal furs, sparking the Iroquois to undertake extensive fur hunting to meet the demand for new goods among their people. Around this period, tensions started escalating between the Iroquois Confederacy and other tribes backed by the French. The Iroquois controlled the area of New York, south of Lake Ontario and west of the Hudson River. Their territory was almost entirely bordered by Algonquian-speaking tribes who were traditionally either competitors or enemies. This included the Shawnee to the west in the Ohio country, the Neutral Nation and Huron Confederacies along the western shore of Lake Ontario and southern shore of Lake Huron to the west, and the Susquehannock to the south. The Iroquois Federation, comprising five nations, often found themselves at odds with these surrounding tribes. Back in 1628, a key event unfolded when the Mohawk tribe overcame the Mohicans, effectively pushing them to the eastern side of the Hudson River. This victory allowed the Mohawks to exclusively trade with the Dutch settlers at Fort Orange, located in what was known as New Netherland at the time. Around the same area, the Susquehannocks, another powerful group, benefited from their access to Dutch arms. They managed to weaken the Delaware tribe and emerged victorious from a lengthy conflict with colonists from Maryland. By the time the 1630s rolled around, the Iroquois Confederacy had fully equipped themselves with European firearms thanks to their robust trading relationships with the Dutch. This access to firearms wasn't just for show. It was critical for the Iroquois, playing a central role in their survival and way of life. They became skilled in using the arquebus, a type of early firearm, in battles against their traditional foes, including the Algonquins and Hurons, among others. On a different note, the French took a stricter stance, banning the sale of firearms to their indigenous allies. They did, however, make exceptions, offering firearms as gifts to those who embraced Christianity. But the Iroquois, using their military advantage, didn't hesitate to attack their old adversaries, such as the Algonquins and Hurons, who were aligned with the French, thus putting them directly at odds with France. The fur trade was booming during this era, primarily fueled by European demand. Unfortunately, this led to a drastic decrease in the beaver population, 
especially noticeable in the Hudson Valley by 1640, thanks to overhunting. American Heritage magazine pointed out that the scarcity of beavers in the mid-17th century intensified conflicts in the region. As the beaver became rare in Iroquois territory, the fur trade moved northward to the colder southern Ontario region. This area was dominated by the Neutral and Huron tribes, who were closely linked with the French through trade, setting the stage for further conflicts in the fur trade's lucrative but dangerous waters. When the beaver population began to drop, the Iroquois, in search of new resources, turned their attention to conquering neighbouring tribes. In 1638, they seized all the territory from the Wenro, who were forced to seek protection with the Hurons. The Wenro had been a protective barrier for the Iroquois against the much larger Neutral and Erie tribes. With encouragement from the Dutch, their main European trading allies, the Iroquois strategically shifted their focus northward. This relationship was crucial for the Dutch, who benefited from the fur trade through their Hudson River posts. As the fur resources dwindled, so did the profits for these trading outposts. In 1641, the Mohawks proposed peace and a trading partnership to the French in New France, but were turned down to avoid betraying their Huron allies. Conflict escalated in the early 1640s, with the Iroquois launching attacks on Huron villages to disrupt their trade with the French. In an attempt to bring peace, French officials brokered a treaty in 1645, granting the Iroquois trading privileges in New France. However, when the Iroquois arrived to trade their furs, the French directed them to the Hurons, sparking outrage and a return to war. The French decided to actively enter the conflict, siding against the Iroquois, who numbered between 25,000 to 30,000, similar to the Hurons. In 1647, the Hurons, alongside the Susquehannocks, outnumbered the Iroquois thanks to their alliance. Yet, their strategy to divide the Iroquois Confederacy failed. The year saw minor clashes, leading to a significant battle in 1648, where a fur convoy broke through an Iroquois blockade, dealing them a severe blow. By the early 1650s, the conflict had shifted with the Iroquois, led by the dominant Mohawks, directly attacking French territories. Despite some tribes like the Oneida and Onondaga maintaining peaceful relations with the French, the Iroquois expanded their control significantly across North America. In 1666, the French retaliated, capturing Chief Canakees and destroying Iroquois resources, which led to a devastating winter for the Iroquois. Over the years, the Iroquois intensified their unity and military coordination, significantly boosting their collective strength by the 1660s. Despite the unrest, the resilience and bravery of certain French-Canadian figures became legendary. Dollard de Ormeau notably sacrificed his life in 1660, halting an Iroquois raid and thus protecting Montreal. In 1692, 14-year-old Marie-Madeleine Jarre heroically defended Fort Verscher against an Iroquois onslaught. These events highlight the era's tumultuousness and the courage displayed by individuals amidst the conflicts. Back in 1648, the Dutch decided to break with tradition by selling firearms directly to the Mohawks, a move that saw the Mohawks beef up their arsenal with 400 guns in no time. This significant armament allowed the Iroquois Confederacy to send a force of 1,000 armed warriors into Huron territory as winter began. This force launched a ferocious attack, destroying key Huron villages, killing many warriors, and taking thousands captive to be later integrated into their own society. Tragically, among those killed were Jesuit missionaries Jean Brebeuf, Charles Garnier, and Gabriel Lallemand, each honoured as martyrs by the Roman Catholic Church. The few Huron survivors scattered, seeking safety in different directions. Some found refuge with Jesuits in Quebec, others were adopted by the Iroquois, and the rest merged with the Petun, or Tobacco Nation, eventually evolving into the Wyandot people. The Iroquois' expansion was briefly checked by the Ottawa tribe, yet they still gained control over a region rich in fur without any remaining tribes to block their access to the French in Canada. In the years leading up to this war, diseases wreaked havoc on the Iroquois and their neighbours, severely reducing their populations. To compensate for the loss of warriors, the Iroquois focused on adopting a large number of their captives, aiming to integrate them into their tribes. They even welcomed Jesuit missionaries into their lands to educate those who had converted to Christianity. The Jesuits made efforts to reach out to the Iroquois, leading to many adopting Roman Catholicism or blending the new teachings with their traditional beliefs. However, these apparent military victories for the Iroquois were not without their own set of problems. The sheer number of captives was more than the Iroquois society could smoothly assimilate, leading to internal divisions. Many captives resisted full integration, clinging to their original beliefs. Consequently, 
significant groups eventually leaned towards forming alliances with the French, moving north towards Montreal for trade opportunities. Ironically, through their aggressive actions against the Huron, the Iroquois inadvertently set the stage for a strengthened French presence in the region. In 1650, the Iroquois launched an attack on the neutral tribe, successfully forcing them out of their homeland by the end of 1651. During this onslaught, they killed or integrated thousands of neutral people who had lived in an area stretching from the Niagara Peninsula to the Grand River Valley. Just a few years later, in 1654, the Iroquois went after another tribe, the Erie, though this time they faced tougher resistance. Nevertheless, after two years of fighting, By 1656, the Iroquois had dismantled the Erie Confederacy. The Erie, who chose not to escape westward, had lived along the southeastern shore of Lake Erie and had around 12,000 members back in 1650. Despite being vastly outnumbered by the tribes they attacked, the Iroquois managed to secure their victories with the help of firearms they acquired from Dutch traders. This strategic advantage was key to their success during these conflicts. The Iroquois were a dominant force in the areas around New France, regularly raiding areas close to Quebec and Montreal. In a bold move in May 1660, 160 Iroquois warriors attacked Montreal, capturing 17 French colonists. The very next year, they struck again, taking 10 more captives with a force of 250 warriors. Over 1,661 and 1,662, they also targeted the Abenakis, allies of the French, in several raids. In response, the French crown decided to take action by forming a small military group composed of French, Hurons and Algonquins to fend off the Iroquois attacks. However, this group faced a brutal attack from the Iroquois, with only 29 Frenchmen managing to survive and escape. Tragically, five were captured and tortured to death. Despite this grim outcome, the Iroquois also incurred substantial losses, which led their leaders to start thinking about making peace with the French. The situation began to shift in the mid-1660s, A significant boost came with the arrival of the Carignan Salières Regiment, which brought around 1,000 professional soldiers to Canada, the first of their kind in the region. New leadership in New France also meant a new strategy. They began selling arms directly to their indigenous allies. Adding to the Iroquois' challenges, their Dutch allies lost control of New Netherland to the English in 1664, decreasing European support for the Iroquois. Following these events, The Onondaga, Seneca, and Cayuga decided to make peace with the French. However, the Mohawk and Oneida were not ready to stop fighting. In January 1666, Governor Daniel de Rémy de Courcelles led an invasion into Mohawk territory with 400 to 500 men, but they couldn't penetrate deep due to harsh winter conditions. Another effort was made in September 1666 by Alexandre de Prouville de Tracy, this time with a larger force of about 1,300 men. By the time they reached the Mohawk villages in mid-October, the villages were empty. Tracy ordered the destruction of the longhouses and crops, marking a crucial moment in the conflict. Eventually, in July 1667, a peace settlement was reached with the Mohawk and Oneida, bringing an end to the confrontations. After making peace with the French, the Iroquois focused again on expanding westward in their quest to control the land between the Algonquin people and the French. This push led eastern tribes such as the Lakotas to move across the Mississippi River to the Great Plains during the early 1800s. Here, they embraced a lifestyle that involved riding horses and moving frequently, characteristics they became famous for. Meanwhile, other tribes seeking refuge ended up in the Great Lakes region, causing tension with the tribes already living there. In the Ohio country, the situation was tense with the Shawnee and Miami tribes holding sway. The Iroquois didn't take long to overpower the Shawnee in central Ohio, driving them into Miami land. The Miamis, a strong tribe, united with their neighbors, including the Potawatomi and the Illini of Michigan and Illinois, to form a confederation. Much of the combat involved the Anishinaabeg Confederacy fighting against the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois kept improving their combat method, launching surprise attacks farther from home. They would use canoes for stealthy night travel, sink them with rocks to hide on the river bottom, and then emerge from the woods to attack their targets, creating chaos before the opposition could effectively respond. The Algonquin tribes, despite their numbers, were at a severe disadvantage without firearms, unable to organize a unified defense against the Iroquois. Consequently, many tribes relocated west of the Mississippi River, leaving vast areas nearly empty. However, thousands of Anishinaabe warriors remained near Lakes Huron and Superior, later playing a key role in countering the Iroquois spread. 
Even from west of the Mississippi, dislocated groups did not give up, continuing to assemble war parties to reclaim their lands. Starting in the 1670s, the French explored and settled in the Ohio and Illinois countries, establishing trading posts like Tassinong to interact with the western tribes. The Iroquois, aiming to control the fur trade with Europeans, destroyed it. They also pushed the Manahawk tribe out of northern Virginia's Piedmont region in 1670, declaring it their hunting ground by right of conquest, an assertion recognized by the English in treaties during the 1670s and 1680s, although the English secured the land from the Iroquois by a treaty in 1722. In 1689, during a raid into the Illinois country, the Iroquois took numerous captives and decimated a large Miami settlement, prompting the Miami to seek help from the Anishinaabe Confederacy. A formidable force ambushed the Iroquois near South Bend, Indiana, using newly acquired firearms to deal a devastating blow and significantly depopulate the region. Without the ability to establish a permanent settlement over such a vast area, the Iroquois lost their grip on the territory, which allowed many displaced people to return home. After defeating tribes in the north and west, the Iroquois shifted their focus to the south, eyeing the Susquehannock. By the 1550s, the Susquehannock were at their height of power, a status they leveraged well into the next decades. In the winter of 1652, they faced a Mohawk attack. Though they managed to fend it off, this clash drove them to draw up a peace and friendship treaty with Maryland. When the Oneida attacked the Piscataway in 1660, Maryland not only expanded its treaty with the Susquehannock into a full-blown alliance, but also offered military help, describing them as the region's protective barrier. Maryland sent 50 men to defend the Susquehannock village and supplied arms and ammunition. Despite a devastating smallpox outbreak in 1661, the Susquehannock skillfully defended against a siege by 800 warriors from the Seneca, Cayuga and Onondaga tribes in May 1663, and even crushed an Onondaga war party in 1666. The battling between the Iroquois and Susquehannock went on and off until 1674, when Maryland decided to switch its Native American strategy seeking peace with the Iroquois and ending its alliance with the Susquehannock. Many believe a major Iroquois victory over the Susquehannock occurred around 1674, as noted in the 1675 Jesuit relations, stating the Seneca utterly defeated their ancient and redoubtable foes. In 1676, the Susquehannock moved south into Maryland, where later that year, they suffered a betrayal when Virginia and Maryland militias assassinated their chiefs under truce and laid siege to their fort, leading to their eventual absorption by the Iroquois. On another front, as English settlers moved into former Dutch territories in Upper New York State, they formed an alliance with the Iroquois, supplying them with firearms to help stand against French expansion. The French, led by Governor Louis de Bois, aimed to boost the Western fur trade, which put them in direct competition with the Iroquois, reigniting conflict. The French lifted an armed sail ban to Indians, arming Algonquin tribes to help balance the power dynamics. This conflict spanned a decade. In 1681, France negotiated a treaty with the Miami and Illinois tribes to counter Iroquois influence. Following renewed attacks, the French bolstered their militia in New France with regular Navy troops. In 1687, Governor Denonville led an expedition, capturing 50 Iroquois leaders and sending them to France as slaves, a move that escalated hostilities, including the burning of Lachine by the Iroquois. Fort Denonville was later built near Lake Ontario. Denonville's successor, Frontenac, upon recognizing the strategic blunder, managed to return 13 surviving Iroquois leaders to New France. During King William's War, the French, alongside their native allies, led raids into English territory, which had allied with the Iroquois against the French. Notable attacks included the massacres at Chenectadi, New York, and raids in New Hampshire and Maine. Despite the raids, some settlers were taken captive, with New England communities raising money for their return, although some captives were integrated into native tribes. The war's dynamic didn't change with the 1697 Treaty of Ryswick, which ended the conflict between France and England, but left the underlying issues in the New World unresolved. By the late 1690s, the Iroquois nations began to view the rapidly expanding 13 colonies as a more significant threat than their old rivals, the French. This shift in perception was especially notable given the foundation and growth of Pennsylvania, which was established in 1681 and began to press against the southern edge of Iroquois territory. 
After decades of conflict with the Iroquois, the French decided that making peace would be the best strategy to secure their hold on the lucrative fur trade in the north. However, when the 13 colonies got wind of the potential treaty, they tried everything to block it, fearing the loss of the vital Albany fur trade and increased vulnerability to French attacks without Iroquois support. Despite these efforts, a landmark agreement was reached. In 1701, the French and 39 Indian chiefs came together to sign the Great Peace of Montreal. This treaty was a turnaround, with the Iroquois agreeing to halt their raids and allow displaced groups from the Great Lakes region to return to their homes. This allowed several tribes, including the Shawnee, Miami, Potawatomi and Illinois, to reclaim territories stretching from the Ohio country and lower Allegheny River to Indiana, northwest Ohio, Michigan and Illinois. This period of tranquility extended into the 1720s, marking a significant era of peace in the region. Back in 1768, some of the 13 colonies decided to buy what was known as the Iroquois Claim to the lands of Ohio and Illinois, setting up the Indiana Land Company to manage this claim across the Northwest. They held on to this claim, which was rooted in the Iroquois right of conquest, until the whole operation was shut down by the United States Supreme Court in 1798. During the American Revolutionary War, quite a few Iroquois people sided with the British, especially those from the Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, and Seneca nations. These groups had built strong trading relationships with the British and were hoping the British would help prevent American expansion onto their lands. When the war ended in favour of the Americans, the British had to give up a large chunk of their North American territories to the newly established United States. They also had to figure out how to make it right for the American loyalists and Native Americans who had lost their lands, moving some loyalists to Canada and trying to compensate others. Joseph Brandt, a Mohawk chief, led a considerable group of Iroquois to what is now the Six Nations of the Grand River Reserve in Ontario. This new area, close to Canadian military bases and along the border, was chosen to keep an eye out for any potential American advances. The Western Confederacy, a group of Native American tribes, saw themselves forced to give up a huge area, including what's now Ohio, through the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. On the note of New France, the French colony's dealings with the Iroquois and other native tribes in the Great Lakes region really shaped the dynamics of the area. New France turned out to be less prosperous and more fraught with violence than people like Champlain had hoped. The French got caught up in complex native alliances, often finding themselves and these tribes at odds with one another. This mingling also introduced diseases, weapons and warfare, further devastating the native populations in these regions. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.